so yeah, as Rituban said, I am going to talk about gravitational waves uh, and gravitational lensing, but uh, in the context of gravitational waves. So let's see so if this works. Three ones. And let me try again. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, let me start with the uh, some background of the gravitation waves. So as you uh, may have heard uh, in the news in the last few years, Einstein's prediction for gravitational waves came true when the first uh, direct detection of uh, a merger of binary black holes were made in the year uh, 2015 by the LIGO Virgo collaboration. Um, and uh, there are expected to be different kinds of gravitational wave sources uh, to be detected. Uh, the, the different uh, mechanisms uh, or the types of gravitational wave sources that we expect to find are these in spirals of compact binary coalescence, which means mergers of uh, a system of uh, binary uh, objects. Uh, stochastic process, processes, uh, with these could arise from very early in the universe or it just it could just be a, a stochastic background arising from hundreds and hundreds of uh, mergers or different kinds of gravitational wave sources that we cannot really resolve. Um, continuous emission from binary or isolated sources. So these could come from individual objects which are rotating and have some sort of inhomogeneity in the, in the shape of the, or the structure of the objects. Uh, and uh, but uh, they could emit gravitation waves. Uh, gravitation waves. There could also be um, some sort of uh, bursts, like burst like gravitation wave sources, uh, for which we don't really know any um, any particular origins yet. But these are just some unknowns that uh, we might expect to see. So this is uh, historically, you know, um, in astronomy, people have, uh, when they have conducted imaging surveys or spectroscopic surveys, they've always found something that is unknown, something that was unexpected. So that's what this particular category is for. Like we, we you know, all the others, we sort of know what the underlying physical uh, processes could be or the kind of, or the nature of objects could be, but these bursts could come from, any other unknown phenomena and they may not have any characteristic shape or characteristic features. And so that's what is encompassed in these burst kind of sources. So let me try this once more. <laughs> yeah, this happens with me always. So that's then I just go back to this. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> so uh, one question. So uh, what is burst like sources? So in LIGO, there is a bank of templates and they are matched to the data, but we don't have a template of the unknown sources, and exactly uh, we can't uh, go over it. Yeah, right? yeah. So yeah, so so exactly. I, I'll come to it uh, in a bit, but the the main idea is for different types of sources, they try to employ different methods. So the the one that you mentioned, it is indeed for the uh, CBC kind of sources where we expect uh, these mergers and we, we know exactly what the waveform should look like. But for bursts, where we don't, ex we don't know what the structure is going to be, we don't know how the signal is going to look like, they just look for excess power. So they have different algorithms for searching for something that could have excess power in uh, whatever some short time scales. So here I'm uh, showing the different observatories that are operational right now uh, all over the world. Um, so LIGO, the, there are two observatories uh, located at Hanford and Livingston. The third observatory is going to be in LIGO in India, which is called LIGO India. Uh, and then there is Virgo uh, and Kagra, which is also part of this uh, collaboration. So it's called the LIGO Virgo Kagra collaboration, collaboration now, LVP. And then GEO 600 is a much smaller um, detector. Uh, so it's not really officially part of the collaboration. Uh, so right now, um, uh, so uh, you know, uh, from the beginning of this uh, LIGO, um, collaboration, uh, LIGO collaboration observations, which started around 2015, since then there have been multiple observing runs, which means they take observations, then they uh, the detector is down for some maintenance and upgrades and so on. So like that, we have had three observing runs until now. And uh, uh, right now, uh, the fourth observing run is going on. And uh, currently, uh, so this has happened after a major upgrade. Uh, the fourth observing, observing run started in May uh, this year. So right now, uh, the uh, these two detectors uh, are the only ones which are operational. Uh, the Virgo and Kagra, they are still undergoing maintenance and upgrades. So right now, uh, these two detectors are running and taking the data. 
So, uh, so let me show the results from the latest, uh, the third observing run. This is the sort of a visual uh, summary of, you can see of the various uh, gravitational sources that have been detected. The x-axis does not carry any meaning. You can just uh, uh, distribute them however you like. The y-axis is, is what uh, shows the masses of the system. And you can put, pick any one particular point and you can see this particular line here, for example, which has three points. So each point, the, so the, the first two points show the the uh, in the uh, the merging kind of systems, it shows the first, uh, sorry, the primary merger and the, sorry, the primary object and the secondary object. So it is the masses that you can see for the primary and the secondary. Uh, and then uh, the the final uh, ma uh, mass of the, um, uh, uh, what is it called? The, um, the final black hole that is formed, uh, that's the mass that's being shown here. So each each line here shows uh, basically the masses of the primary, the secondary, and the final uh, uh, mass that uh, final black hole that is formed. And you can see the overall uh, population. As you can see, uh, the blue shows black holes, and there are uh, neutron stars which are shown here in orange, which are uh, handled down over here. Uh, and just for comparison, they, uh, this plot also shows some uh, black holes and neutron stars which are found from electromagnetic studies. Uh, so, but you can basically get an idea of uh, what is the distribution of the masses that are found from these uh, gravitational uh, observations, which are basically uh, consisting of only these inspiraling uh, coalescence Kind of systems. Is the y-axis? I cannot give you the mass of the black hole. The masses. No, that I understand. But the y-axis is what? The top one is two hundred or two hundred. Yes, two hundred. And it's from one to two hundred. No, it's no, it's not. It's not. It's not yes, linear. Yeah, one, two, five, ten, up to two hundred. Yeah, linear. 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 Yes. Yeah, from the EM observation. Yeah, these points here and the ones here at the bottom, these are from EM electromagnetic observations of black holes and neutron stars. And the orange ones, as you can see, the, the population of neutron stars, uh, the binary neutron stars is uh, much smaller than the ones from the... So, 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 on a previous quickly, because as you said, the x-axis makes the meaning, it's just yeah. aesthetic, so yeah. it looks nice. But one thing uh, I can see is that the blue guys and the red guys, the EM and the GW black holes, if I consider, then, so is it because uh, the, the, the adult, so those are the merging ones, right? Yeah, it's not the that there's a mass segregation. I mean, the masses are kind of similar for EM and gravitational waves. Not so, really. Not really. I mean, no, you don't see the higher masses in the different ones. ones. Also, you can see that it's not really that many EM observations to begin yeah. with. So it's more of an observational selection bias, I would say. And then the in and the neutron star, I can see about so from three, three or four solar mass and below. Yeah. And then some of these orange ones, I don't know what's the mass uncertainty of these guys, but they are pretty high. I mean, they are higher than the yellow ones, right? The orange, orange, the the GW yellow, the neutron stars, yeah, uh, would be one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> three, about ten in number. If that, are, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. ten, it may be ten. I don't know if this is red or orange, but they seem to be a little higher than the yellow. Ones. Yeah, so these over here, these are shown with both colors. So these are the neutron star binary, uh, so neutron star black hole binary, binary system, system. NSBH. Yes. Yeah. So the ones, uh, I mean, uh, so. The the uh, the two um, uh, objects in the binary system were neutron star, but they ended up uh, in a, in this um, um, final uh, component, which actually uh, is maybe like a it's not fully clear whether it's a, a black hole or it's a neutron star because of its mass. Okay. Yeah, and here the ones going from here to here, which is a neutron star by a black hole. Kind of system. Yes. NFBH. So, yeah, I mentioned this, but let me just uh, say this uh, even more clearly here. So, the, the most 
or the, the only kind of uh, gravitational wave source that we have seen so far are these, uh, the CVC, which is the compact binary coalescence, which is uh, arising from the merger of two objects which are going uh, around each other. Uh, so these could these could uh, comprise of either both black holes or both neutron stars or one neutron star and one black hole. Uh, and the in the early stages, uh, we see uh, these gravitational wave signals uh, at certain frequencies as the uh, two uh, objects, let's say two black holes, as, as they are coming closer and closer. Uh, this is the in spiral phase and when they come extremely close together th that's the merger phase uh, where uh, they basically merge and then uh, there is this final phase which is called the ring down which is where the final um, uh, remnant uh, is formed which is another black hole and so that's this ring down so this um, the typical cvc signal comprises of these three components you can see the in spiral the merger and the ring down uh, and these kind of systems are very well um, uh, understood by our theory uh, of relativity and are also defined by these uh, set of parameters. Uh, some of them are intrinsic parameters like the masses and spins of these uh, binary systems, uh, binary objects, and extrinsic parameters, which include the luminosity distance, the sky location, uh, the polarization angle, uh, phase, uh, time of coalescence, and so on. So with the help of these uh, parameters, we can define uh, a given um, signal, how exactly it would look like uh, uh, based on our understanding of the physical description of the system. And so we, we can then uh, compare it with the data to see what sort of things we should see. And we, we can search for these kind of signals. So one of the uh, commonly used method is this called, uh, which is make, making use of the template bank. So what you do is that you, uh, you generate these uh, CVC waveforms in, in covering a large uh, space in the parameter space of the masses of the binary uh, system. And uh, you basically generate these kind of a library of waveforms. And you then uh, take each of these waveforms from your library or the template bank as it is called, and then you cross correlate with it your data. So that's what is shown here. So the what is shown here in the blue is uh, the real data. Uh, and the signal is actually present there, but you cannot see it with your eyes. Uh, so what is shown here in red is the signal, underlying signal, how it would look like. Uh, and so that's the kind of template that is uh, being cross correlated with the data. And whenever, wherever there is um, a high, wherever the cross correlation has a high value, that's where the match, uh, that's where the match occurs. And this method is uh, uh, used for searching for the CVC sources. The, this is the most accurate method for searching for uh, the CVC signals, as it makes use of the you know physical um, description of how the signal would look like. So these this falls in this uh, model searches, and there are um, um, uh, these uh, packages, Python packages, which are developed called PyCVC, GSTLR, and so on, which make use of this uh, match filtering process. Uh, yeah, I've just uh, written here the description of the the, the cross correlation yeah. which is done and um, and then uh, weighted by the noise of the noise in the data. Uh, so that's the match filtering uh, method. And uh, there are other methods as I was saying, which are called unmodeled searches, which are mainly uh, used for searching for burst like signals. Um, and there are uh, a few algorithms which are dedicated for that. Then there are third kind of algorithms, which are called the machine learning algorithms. Uh, these are not necessarily specifically for any particular, uh, I mean, they can be designed for any different kinds of uh, signals, uh, but obviously they are right now mainly driven by the search for CBC sources. Uh, and I've just listed here a few references uh, in which they have uh, attempted to uh, design various machine learning algorithms, which can help you to find these CVC signals and um, uh, um, allow us to detect uh, these uh, signals much much more rapidly. Uh, just one thing I wanted to point here is uh, there is something called Gravity Spy. This is a citizen science project. Uh, in case you have not heard of uh, the, what the citizen science project means, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, you know, the citizen science project is a, a project where uh, you can, you, you know, you can typically typically upload your data on some website 
and that website is then accessible to everyone uh, all over the world. Uh, so it's accessible to the citizens of the world. And uh, so anyone can have uh, access to the website. They can uh, inspect or analyze the data based on whatever tools are provided on the website. And they can help you to do real science. So that is a rough idea of uh, a citizen science project. Uh, so in this project, uh, what they have done is that they have combined machine learning and citizen science. So with machine learning, they um, uh, they first analyze the data and pre-select some candidates. And those candidates are then further analyzed by the Gravity project. Uh, and these two algorithms, they work together to uh, give us a better uh, ability to detect um, signals although uh, the main uh, the main idea uh, or at least the initial in the initial stages gravity spy was mainly designed for um, characterizing certain kinds of noise like features and let me just come to that here so uh, in if, if you look at the gravitational data then it then you know in addition to the signals, obviously there, there are all kinds of noise features that are seen in the, in the data. And I've shown, uh, on the right hand side, I've shown some examples. So these um, these are very short duration noise, uh, transient noise features. Um, so these are called glitches. So here are different examples of uh, different types of glitches. So this one is called glit. This one is called whistle and this one is called scattered light. There are many more categories, like a dozen or more categories of different types of glitches. Some of them have um, have been uh, tracked down to the physical origins as to where they're coming from. And uh, in the collaboration, they have managed to um, reduce the source of the, those noises or then they have tried to model the noise and try to get rid of the noise from the data. But uh, some examples like the blip glitches, the origin of these glitches is completely unknown. And they seem to be, uh, the, uh, the frequency of occurrence of these glitches is extremely high. So these uh, blip glitches, they are also uh, have a very similar uh, appearance to uh, a CVC solar. So this, this particular uh, image here, so what I'm showing here is actually a frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So these are called uh, time frequency spectrograms. And there's quite some similarity between a uh, gravitational wave event and blip. Uh, so let me show here in a, with a time series uh, plot. Uh, so the the blue, uh, uh, the underlying blue uh, uh, points that you're seeing here, those are coming from um, uh, a blip. And what is over plotted here in red is actually a CBC signal. So here you can see that here in this particular example, you can see that there's much more similarity uh, between a, a blip glitch and a CBC signal. So these glitches, they, especially the blip glitches, they affect the uh, detection, uh, our uh, detection efficiency of the CBC signals. And uh, since the, the, the frequency of occurrence is so high that we need to do something about uh, our algorithms, uh, designing of our algorithms so that we can uh, we can uh, detect them, uh, detect or get rid of these blip glitches uh, much more efficiently. So uh, in in the past, people have tried to do this using different methods. Uh, in in our case, we tried to use a slightly different approach. Uh, so we want to we wanted to use machine learning, uh, but we have also modified the input data itself. So what we are doing instead of using the time frequency spectrograms or the time series signal, uh, we are using uh, something called the sine Gaussian projection maps. So what we're doing here is that we're taking the gravitational wave signal and then we're cross correlating it with a sine Gaussian function. So this is how it is described here. And so uh, what we do, uh, so the sine Gaussian function is mainly uh, can be defined with two parameters. One is Q, um, which is over here, the, which is called the quality factor. And it is, uh, it gives you a sense of how broad the sine Gaussian function is. Uh, and then the second one is the F naught, which is the central frequency of the sine Gaussian. So, so we, we make use of these two parameters. We vary these two parameters and we uh, cross correlate our signal uh, with the, with these sine Gaussian functions to generate this kind of math. So what you're seeing here on the y-axis is this quality factor Q and the F naught, which is the central frequency. Both these parameters are the 
uh, are the parameters of the sine Gaussian function itself. So what we are showing here is if you if you take your CBC signal and you cross correlate with different types of sine Gaussian functions, right? Where do you see the highest correlation, right? So this is the this here uh, the uh, so the this y-axis goes uh, from uh, the, the from bottom to top. So the small q values are here, and the small uh, f naught values are over here, top right. So the fact that you are seeing a high correlation in this top left corner, it means that the uh, a given CBC signal um, uh, can be represented by small q and small f naught values. That's what this means. So when we project our signal onto the parameter space of a sine Gaussian, we get this kind of a sine Gaussian projection map. And since this is a like an image, we make use of this image um, to um, to uh, analyze this with the help of machine learning algorithms like the convolutional neural network CNNs, uh, and we uh, we attempt to distinguish these. Uh, Binary black hole signals from these blip glitches. So, so the, sorry, if, if, I, if I misunderstood something, what is the goal? So you take the gravitational wave signal and you are doing this uh, sign of this is just an, this is just to show an example, right? In the data, you will have signal plus noise. Yes. Yeah, this is an example. Yeah. Thing. But the, what is the goal? Like, why? Why do you want to do these projections? What are you supposed to? Extract from there the so uh, I'll show you oh, in the next, the next slide. slide. So sorry. Uh, let me just show the all the panels here. So let me interrupt. So your sine Gaussian uh, signal. This is some present uh, some kind of presentation of your noise. No, it is the data. So data has signal plus noise. But sorry. if it has signal, this is what we show with, or I can also show here. Uh, if if we have a BBH signal. Then this is where it will have high projection. That's what we are showing. So then, uh, why do we have a sine Gaussian? Maybe that's your question, Amit. That why did the sine Gaussian? Let me come. Let me come to okay. this for next point here. That uh, okay. I mean, I'll I'll address the sine Gaussian part in a bit. The first thing I want to show here is that uh, so here I'm showing two panels. Uh, so this is a BVH signal. Uh, on the uh, same the sine Gaussian projection map showing, you can clearly see uh, this panel is for the uh, Hanford detector. The other panel is for Livingston detector. So the two detectors, same BBH signal, mm -hmm. uh, how it projects on the, uh, to uh, the data from these two detectors. Now, if we take a glitch or a blip glitch specifically, you this is how the projection looks like in one of the detectors. Okay. And because it's a glitch, because it is not an astrophysical source or astrophysical feature, you will not necessarily see the same exact thing at the same time in the other detector. So for this particular, this is a real glitch. Okay, real glitch, this is how the projection looks like. On the uh, same time for the L1 detector, this is how the projection is. And what you are seeing here is basically noise. This is noise. Okay, so very clearly what you can see from this particular uh, comparison is that if you have an astrophysical plus like a BBH source, then this is where you expect to see the high projection. Whereas if you have a glitch, uh, more specifically a blip glitch, then this is sort of the thing that you might see where that there is a projection in one of them and just noise in the other. And also the projection, where the projection is high is different for a BBH versus a blip. So, so the uh, yeah. So the frequency you have chosen, you have chosen for the Gaussian thing. Yeah. Uh, is this that comparable to your black hole uh, frequency, black hole merger frequency, and things like that? The frequency or is oh, it's not here. The frequency is visible here, which is going from uh, like uh, I don't know, 50, 20, 20, 30 hertz to five hundred thousand, five hundred hertz. This range. No. Is uh, this range is the range for LIGO frequency? No. Uh, this is where also we expect to see the signal. No, the but frequency of the your Gaussian. I think you uh, mean the F not F not 
If not, I, then, uh, choosing the if not time. I am not choosing, right? That's why it is varying from in the entire. I'm not choosing. I'm showing how it. That is if not. Uh, yes, yes. I'm showing how it looks for different if not, and how it looks for different hue. And so that if not must be matching with the uh, uh, signal and frequency. That's why you will get a peak in the cross correlation. Uh, well, uh, yeah, kind of, but as you can see that it's not one single F0 that is going to match, right? So there's a spread. Uh, so let me uh, just uh, answer the question related to the sign Gaussian as to why sign Gaussian. Because these glitches have been uh, shown to be a good, uh, the functional form of the, or like the profile of the glitches seems to be very close to a sign Gaussian. And in fact, these time frequency spectrograms that you're seeing here, they, they are actually made using sign Gaussian um, functions themselves. But the parameter space that you're looking at here is actually the gravitational wave frequency and the time of the gravitational wave event. So here we are sort of taking the same sign, sign Gaussian, but mapping it to the gravitational wave parameters. This is the conventional way of looking at the data. Uh, and what you are seeing here in the like colors, those are the, just the power, just the power. But uh, in um, so these are all you know like smoothened images. But this map is divided into grid cells, and each grid cell has a specific value of Q and F naught, which you cannot see. Uh, that has been internally optimized. So this image is some combination of Q and F naughts for each grid cell. Uh, whereas the other images that we have created, they are now in the parameter space of the sine Gaussian function itself. So here we can see which combination of Q and F naught are good choice to represent your signal. Signal meaning glitch or actual CBC signal. So it's a historical sort of reason to go with sine Gaussian because they have been used previously and they seem to be a good fit to the, some of these glitches. So, uh, so the signal detection is done by the machine learning algorithm or is there a parameter space that you constrain your Q and F not Q and then decide? Uh, uh... No, no, no. They, they, we, we have used this range. This is the range we are using. Uh, and then we just analyze this with the machine learning. Uh, the... So, uh, is that a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that uh, this looks very gastic. Uh, the, the noise map looks very gastic than the other one. So yes. I, what I'm thinking is that instead of using, let's say, uh, some uh, machine learning algorithm, can we uh, maybe use some kind of uh, simple, more analytical form of function or something to parameterize this whole thing and then try to find out if this thing, this is a signal and this is not a signal or a blip. That thing can be, I mean, I'm saying that a more, more conventional approach instead of some machine learning approach can need to be done since this looks very drastic. But this looks drastic because I'm projecting on the sign Gaussian drastic meaning. What you're seeing is yeah, that I'm you are seeing. Basically, from, uh, in, from, by comparing these two uh, lower panels, yes. the difference is very uh, apparent. So it, again, it is because only because this part you're seeing noise, which means any feature in yeah. that parameter space is getting triggered like that, right? So here there is a specific feature mm -hmm. present in the data, which is causing higher projection in a specific part. So whenever you will have a specific feature in the data, it will contribute to high cross correlation for a specific Q and F naught combination. So that in fact allows us to distinguish different kinds of signals based on uh, how their functional forms look like, right? Mm -hmm. So uh so this this is what just means like this is just noise so if you see something like this then uh, basically there is nothing in the data so uh, and and also the the work that we have done is only recently right in the past people have attempted non machine learning methods and could not uh, uh, do this task properly specifically for the um for the blip glitches because they are very short duration signals and they look very much so the blip glitches, they're very short duration and they look like these very massive binary black holes. So if you look at, um, I don't know if I have examples, but if you look at uh, the uh, gravitational signals based on the mass of the system, the length of the signals are different. Okay. So when you have a much longer signal, then you have many 
two more cycles, mm -hmm. then you have sufficient uh, information or sufficient signal for you to cross match with the templates, right? But when you have very short duration signals at that time, be because there, there's not much data itself, it can easily confuse it with something else. And so the conventional methods have failed to do this, which is why we try to use something different. So in this parameter space, we found that the massive binary black holes uh, that's where they seem to have higher projection, whereas the blips, they seem to prefer a range of f naughts. Yeah. Even though they are they light up at uh, small q values, but they have a range of f naught, And so that allows us to uh, have some distinguishability, which the conventional methods and the conventional representation could not do it. And so um, we have used a very basic uh, CNN, okay, nothing very fancy. But the data itself allows us to uh, um, discriminate between these massive binary black holes and the glitches. And so that's what is shown here now in form of the results, which are these standard uh, receiver operating characteristic curves shown uh, to, uh, to demonstrate the performance of a neural network al algorithm. Uh, so here we have the true positive rate and the false positive rate. So if you have a very nice uh, network uh, which is performing very nicely then you need to, you would be somewhere here in the top left corner so uh, these different panels uh, show in blue it shows our results uh, here for uh, lower mass bin here for higher mass bin uh, the solid is for higher snr um, the the dotted ones are for lower snr and then we have done comparison with some of the traditional methods the orange and the red and you can clearly see that the, the blue curves, they perform much better compared to the other methods in all the cases, whether you're looking at low or high masses, low or high SNRs, it is doing much better. And uh, then we also tested on the real sample of events. So we did not, uh, we did not run it on the entire data, but on, only on the selected events that are uh, uh, released from the collaboration. So that's the latest uh, catalog of uh, uh, GWTC3 events. Out of those, we found that 95% of them are correctly identified. And uh, this just again shows uh, as a function of low and high SNR, function of low and uh, high mass of the system. And um, uh, the, the extension of this analysis that in addition to now the just the blip glitch, we are including many other different types of glitches in our analysis. So that work is underway and uh, hopefully next time I'll be able to share those results. So uh, in real data you have all glitches present there. Yes, all glitches. <coughs> you have removed them first and then apply your uh, algorithm or? No, so uh, see in the first st st stage of our analysis, we only address the main issue, which was the massive binary black holes, which are uh, confused uh, with the blitz. That's what we achieved here. So now we're extending that to include more types of glitches. So going from blips, we will include the other types that we know, some six to seven other categories, which are also frequently occurring. So once we include that, uh, then we will try to run it on a wider data set to see how well it is still able to uh, do the classification, whether it is still performing efficiently or not. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, right now that process is going on and we are seeing some success, but still uh, we are not fully sure yet <laughs> with our results. So, um, yeah. So how do you constrain your Q value? We are not constraining, right? Here again, we are showing the, all of the Q. So, yes, you are selecting the range of F and Q. F is your operating frequency. So this is your range. And how do you specify the range of Q? This, I mean, it's showing a wide range here already, right? We are not choosing any specific. So I think he's saying that why are you looking at those Q types as, as opposed to some other? Yes, why, because, is yes. why is the range from like 0 to 80 or something like that? Because uh, we can see the signal there, right? Um, the signal is already visible at very low Q values. So there is no point in going to higher Q. So Even the glitch. Yeah, once you experiment, you know, you already know that the, like the glitch also appears here. Even the other glitches that we have looked at, 
they all appear at basically this sound 20, 30 max, not beyond that. It's meaning again, uh, if you try to understand that Q represents how broad that sine Gaussian is. So we don't have something that is very broad. Uh, or uh, broad. This Q is the same Q as for waves, the Q value that you did for resonance, so that Q. So there's a limit to that. Energy. Okay, yeah. so I just want so basically you you're saying that there may be also other kinds of glitches other than the ability. So for them, like what you're doing with the sign notion for the bleed glitches. So is this also supposed to work with or for other kinds of features do you have to think of we other are, we are that's what we're doing. We are actually uh, improving our network. We are including more classes of glitches and we are training our network again on the new training data sets. Mm -hmm to see whether it's able to do the classification. And more or less, we are getting good uh, performance, uh, but now we're testing on the real data by, um, how do you say, like, like take like a chunk of data, okay, and then only look at um, anything that is above a certain SNR, okay? So what will be there in the data, we don't know. So we can just analyze this kind of data set and see what we like, how well we're able to uh, classify. So we are working on that right now. Uh, it's not final yet. Okay, so after this, I'm going to switch to gravitation Um how much time I have? You have. You have like twenty minutes at least. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much you're familiar with gravitational lensing, but uh, generally, what uh, people people are familiar or not? Yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, for example, they listen to students' class. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, in class also, they are taught. Yeah. Um, okay. The GR class, yeah. Okay, so so yeah, so then in gravitational lensing, strong gravitational lensing, I'm not going about weak, strong gravitational lensing, uh, we expect to see multiple images. Uh, of a background source lensed by a galaxy or a group of galaxies in the foreground. Uh, so similar kind of effects we expect to see for gravitational sources. Uh, so here, obviously, we're going to we're not going to see beautiful images like this, but we're going to only see one event, and then after some time, another event occurring. Um, so here, I just wanted to uh, show some beautiful uh, electromagnetic images of strong gravitational lenses and uh, just list a few important uh, properties. So here are uh, images of uh, real gravitational lenses. So here, this is like a galaxy cluster uh, showing a giant arc. Um, so what the typical um, observables that we uh, see in uh, strong lensing of EM sources are multiple images. Uh, so they are separated by some uh, angular separation and you can uh, of course, the main observable is that you can see the positions of the of the images, which is not possible with gravitational wave sources. Uh, then the next thing that we have are magnifications, relative magnifications between the multiple images and the time delays between the multiple images. So I will just go over this quickly since you guys know about this. Uh, so, so these are the main observables for the EM sources. Uh, one uh, one additional point I want to mention is that. If you look at the the uh, um, arrival time surface, so in the absence of a lens, uh, there is a minimum in, in this arrival time surface. Uh, so this is what is referred to as a type one image. And if you put a, a, a lens in between, then uh, with uh, nice alignment between the source and the lens and the observer, we can start to see multiple images. And so these contours will now shift and we will form these additional uh, extrema uh, or some uh, features in these uh, arrival time surfaces. So the, the minimum is the type one. Um, the, the saddle point of the surface is called a type two image. That's where another image is formed. And then there is a, a maximum in the in this surface and that's where the type three images are formed. So there are these different types of images that are, um, uh, that are present in these gravitational lensing uh, phenomena. Although when we are dealing with EM sources, we don't really have to um, think about the type of images or there's not really much we can do with these. But in gravitational wave sources, this can be really useful information, uh, the different types of the images. Uh, so yeah, so let me talk about the uh, 
some specific features of lensing of gravitational wave sources. Uh, just to have this uh, guide here, uh, visual visual guide here, that typically we have a lens and uh, you either form a quad, meaning four images, or you form a double, which means two images. And for the rest of the talk, I will just focus on quads because there are four images. It's much more interesting and it also has many more data constraints compared to a double. Uh, so, but this is how the, the, the blue shows the images roughly. And in a quad system, uh, you can have the type one image and a type two image uh, in a typical uh, galaxy scale lens. Um, and so there are certain combinations of these type one, type two images that are formed uh, for lensing of gravitational wave sources. So the, so the first and foremost thing that if you have a lens gravitational wave source, you will have multiple events coming at different time delays. Uh, and the some of the parameters, which will, which we, uh, some of the parameters will be common to uh, the multiple events. For example, the their masses and their sky localization. So because the gravitation wave observatories, they have very poor angular resolution, several hundred square degrees on the sky. Uh, and the, the angular scale of these systems is few arc seconds. So it's extremely small. So there is no way we cannot uh, we can see the actual direction where, from where these events are coming from. And so uh, for all practical purposes, uh, all these multiple images, they will be coming from basically the same direction. And this is one of the constraints that we make use of. And uh, because of lensing magnification, the distances that we will infer of these events will be affected. Uh, they will be affected by the uh, the square root of the magnification factor. Uh, and uh, the other thing I was saying is that the images of different types, they um, they will have different phase shift based on what type of image you are seeing. So main lensing observables here are time delays, relative magnifications, and phase differences. And uh, uh, so uh, before I talk about... Uh, a further um, analysis, uh, I wanted to just uh, show here some um, uh, work that I had done uh, to project the uh, expected the expected lensing rates uh, that we uh, that we're going to see in the current observing runs of uh, LIGO uh, observations. And uh, so I did this calculation for uh, lensing by an individual galaxy or by a galaxy cluster. And the lensing rates that we are finding are in the range of 10 to the minus 4. That means with a large error bar on it. Uh, so uh, in the best case, it is 1 in a 1,000. 1 in a 1,000 event would be gravitational lens. Um, and here in this table, I'm showing uh, for two different models. These uh, two different models correspond to the merger rate density models for the background population. So depending on what model we use for how often the uh, binaries are occurring or merging, right? Uh, depending on those <laughs> models, we can get really uh, different results. Uh, and so you can also turn this problem around and say that now suppose I have detected a few events or if I have detected no events, then what constraints I can put on the merger rate density models. And that's what is shown here in this plot. Um, where the like if you put no lensing constraints then the blue shaded region uh, shows the uh, range of allowed models and if you now say that i have not detected a single event in my lensed event in my data then it rules out some of these models and now uh, the the range of allowed models uh, is much smaller so uh, okay. yeah sorry please go ahead so this uh, foreground galaxy red sheet should also depends on the detection rate. Foreground galaxy detection. Which is the range. Yeah. That will also affect the number of events or not. Uh, but but what we the way we do is that we say that here are the n number of events in, that are happening in the background. And now after lensing, or oh, sorry, what fraction of these events or sources it will get lensed? So it gets lensed by the foreground galaxy population. And that is also a model, uh, kind of uh, coming from some structure formation model later. Or... Now, what we're saying is that suppose there are 10 events which are distributed in the sky. Mm -hmm. Like merger events. Yeah, merger events or yeah. any source. Any source that is there in the sky, 10 sources. Okay. Then given the number density of those sources, mm -hmm. 
given the lensing probability, uh, given the redshift, given the redshift of the source, given the number density of the source, given uh, the mass of my lens and where it is located somewhere in the lens side, and the lensing optical depth or the lensing probability, given all of these, what is the chance that out of the, uh, what is the chance or what fraction of these 10 sources are going to be lensed? And that's what that number is quoting. But I think his question is that lensing probability, that calculation involves what is the galaxy distribution? The uh, foreground. The, foreground. The, foreground. The, yeah, the foreground, yes. So that galaxy distribution is not in fact known, right? It's somewhat it is known. In fact, it is very much well known compared to any of the other things because it that, comes that, from true. it that, comes from the EM observation. Right, right. And so EM observation. Yes. Because SGS is velocity dispersion function. Yeah. That's the sigma, right? That, that no, that is the lensing cross section. Oh, that's the uh, the um the DN. The DN yeah. by DM, that is that models the mass function of the lens. Mass function of the lens. So if it's if you only consider a galaxy cluster, so like a halo mass function, then you can take some halo mass function, take the etal and so on. Mm. But you can replace that for galaxies. It it is just best to take the SGSS velocity dispersion function. Uh, that's what we make use of. So then, Amrita, my question is that uh, when you quote a number, yes. So the rate, let's say, or what fraction of the events are going to get lens. That's what we are interested in. But wouldn't that depend on like your integral parameters because you are integrating over D rho, D Z, right? I mean, it's the lens, uh, redshift distribution. Yes. All those. So, so what do you, what, what do you assume for that? Like what is the, for example, what is the redshift thickness? But there is an error bar. No, the, this, is the, this is actually like a, just numerically integrated, right? So it's for the entire uh, lens, uh, lens uh, entire red, uh, redshift range going from oh, the lens to the source. source. From yeah. the, from and the source itself is distributed in some redshift range. Yeah, that would be small redshift. No, but that uh, so we actually take the entire like from point one or something or point zero one to redshift ten. Okay. Okay. For each of those source, given the merger rate density model, right? This merger rate density model. So this number is after you quote like the entire kernel for all all, all sources. sources, everything. Yes. So that is why it is integrated okay. over the halo mass or the lens mass, mass. the lens redshift, the source redshift, and, and this B row is a detectability criteria. Yeah, meaning, that's what I was going to ask. It is a detectability criteria, meaning the so the flux there is the lens. Yeah, the lens SNR. Yes. Of the event. Has to be above sudden threshold. threshold. Yeah, exactly. That is what the D row is. So all of those gives you this. Right? Yes. <laughs> uh, but the the, the the like this number they go from near almost like ten to the minus five to ten to the minus three. It's like a really broad range, 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 range. range because and most of the uncertainty is actually coming from this merger rate density models or the PBH population because that is the least. Well, no, no. The lens population is much more well understood because we already have that from the EM lens basis. Yeah. Yeah, so, for all these LIGO detected sources, is the redshift known for all these sources? For, this, for the sources, for the sources, the redshifts, redshift meaning that there is a distance yeah. estimate with quite a big yeah. error bar. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The distance is known from what? The from the signal region. itself. From, from the, the signal, signal itself, one can estimate. So, one can, from the waveform, uh, one can get the chirp mass and one the chirp mass and the amplitude, they define the signal, uh, the frequency evolution of the signal. So, so once we know the chirp mass, we can also infer the amplitude. And once we have the amplitude, we can infer the difference. Of course, there, there are some degeneracies and uncertainties, but there is a luminosity distance estimate. The chirp mass has the one to the multiplied yes. yes. detector frame. Detector frame. So what is the range in a roughly all this? Uh, how many is that? The, the slide that you showed at the beginning. Uh, About like 100. 100 sources. What is the redshift range of one ish, right? Ah, around one or so, not, not one, that many, yeah, much less than one. Less than, yeah, I mean, most one, highest, one, highest one, highest is around one or so, yeah, maybe highest one or two, but it's like mostly like point one, one two ish, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, probably the SNR goes uh, pretty, pretty low, pretty, pretty yeah, 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 okay, so, um. So one of the things that uh, I, I have done is um, 
trying to improve the methods that are there for detecting strongly lensed events. So in the collaboration, we have different pipelines for finding strongly lensed events. Uh, so one of the rapid methods is, uh, which is called a posterior overlap. Uh, and the name itself suggests what it is that given that this there's going to be um so okay for all the uh, practical purposes now we will only focus on event pairs because at a time it is just easier to process a pair of events even though you can have different combinations you can have a triplet or you can have all the four images things like that but it's easier to just work with pairs so in all the strong lensing analysis we just deal with pairs uh, even though it could come from a quadruply lens system so uh, so the the underlying um, idea for the posterior overlap analysis is that if you have a pair of strongly lensed events, then their uh, parameters like the masses and sky localization are going to be the same. So, so you know, whenever an event is detected initially using some of these de detection pipelines like the match filtering and so on, after that they do parameter estimation. So they infer all the parameters maybe using some Bayesian framework. Uh, so they have posterior for all of the parameters, the masses, spins, uh, sky localization, polarization, things like that. So make, when you take the posteriors of these parameters and if you look for overlap between these posteriors, of course, by chance, you will find some overlap in some cases, but uh, um, the, the chance of overlap just ra by random uh, chance is, is much, uh, much lower. So it's only when there is lensing that you expect that they will overlap in the sky and their masses, detector frame masses will also be the same and so on. So that's what is the rough idea to quickly select some candidates which could be strongly lensed. Yes. So you're saying that masses should be the same, but masses are inferred from the amplitude, which is going to get lensed. And yes. So it's the images will be lensed magnified different. Yeah, so it's the detector frame masses that that we expect to be seen. Yeah. Detector from masses. Uh, meaning observed, the observed masses. So, no, but the magnification of these two pair image yeah. are different. The magnification is different, yes. But, so the, their, their, but their distances will, so their distances will also be uh, uh, thought to be different. The distances which will, which will be inferred will also be different. Mass is also measured from something else. That's how you get the distance in the video. So, uh, so this method, the posterior overlap method, uh, co computed this uh, factor called the B overlap, which quantifies uh, how significantly do the posteriors overlap uh, for a pair of events. Plus, then they also had uh, this another quantity, which is called R gal, uh, and this uh, relies on the fact that. Um, uh, that the so here they they show this delta t which is the time delay distribution so if you have a population of events uh, or event pairs then if you just look at the random uh, i mean if you look at the time delay distribution of random event pairs that will be different from the ones which are lensed okay uh, because of lensing uh, the time de uh, the time delays between the event pair actually they the peak happens to be at very short time scales like a few days or so but uh, uh, given the sensitivity of our observations, we don't expect to see events that are happening in a matter of few days or few hours, things like that. So at least for the current sensitivities, um, we, we know very well that the time delays uh, distributions are going to be different for the lensed events and the unlensed events. And so this RGAL will be high. Uh, it will take a higher value um, if it's a lensed event pair, which will have a different peak uh, in the time delay distribution compared to the unless population and so what but what we proposed uh, um, uh, on on top of this particular analysis to uh, uh, not to how to improve this particular uh, analysis is uh, not just to focus on the delta t but also the other uh, two observables which are actually uh, cross which are actually correlated with the time delays so uh, i will show in the so what we are proposing is this uh, a new ranking statistics called the MGAL, which makes use of the joint uh, distributions of these various observables rather than just using delta T. Uh, so what we are showing here um, is for one delta phi, uh, one particular phase shift combination on the left and another phase shift combination on the right, 
so here we are showing the joint distribution. So you can see in the x-axis are delta t, and here are the relative magnifications. The green is for the lens population event pairs, and these colored shaded regions, uh, these are for the unlensed event pairs. So you can clearly see the, the, uh, the shift or the difference in the peaks of these distributions. And also the fact that the time delay is uh, how they are correlated with the, uh, the relative magnifications. And uh, these different points, blue points, show the data, uh, the real uh, data for, for different event pairs. And we find that this particular event pair here, uh, this seems to be almost coincide, coincide, coinciding with one of the uh, peaks of this lensing uh, uh, lens population. And uh, so, so the the previous estimate, the Argyle estimate, which only comes from the delta T, was around eight, a value of eight, which is over here. Uh, sorry, not here in this plot. Uh, the value is around eight. And if we include, in, if we uh, do the uh, MGAL calculation with the, providing the new ranking statistic, it increases the confidence, so to say, uh, to a value of twenty-two. So with this particular event pair, we can clearly see how uh, we are able to boost the confidence. So here is actually the plot which shows the B overlap versus the R gal, which was uh, shown for the events coming from the LIGO collaboration uh, lensing paper. And this, this is that event, this uh, one which is marked here. This is that event which had a value of around eight in this plot. In, uh, and uh, we, we show that, that uh, instead of eight, the value could be 22. So it will uh, move rightwards in this plot. And the, the these contours here, they um, they show the one sigma and two sigma uh, distribution for the background. So any event pair which lies upwards of these lines will be, you know, more like very promising in terms of lensing. Uh, and so the MGAL allows us to move this point uh, towards the right. And that way, but of course, uh, you know, this, this is uh, not a confirmed lens event, but we are just showing that how we can uh, improve the significance of some of these lensing candidates by using the joint uh, distributions. Uh, so I'll just skip that. Um, yeah, I don't have much time. So a couple of minutes. Maybe uh, finish up in... Yeah, so maybe very quickly, just in continuation with that study, uh, we did another uh, uh, study to, again, analyze the population of unlensed and the lensed uh, event pairs. And these curves, again, show the same thing. Like, if you ignore any of the time delays or magnification, but only look at the uh, posterior overlap analysis, it's shown by this blue curve, the solid and the uh, dashed here. So the, the overlapping region is the, where, is the, where, is the region where there's source of confusion. You cannot tell whether it is lensed or not lensed. And uh, when we include when we include uh, these joint the distributions, both the magnifications and time delays shown in the red curves, uh, shown in the red uh, yeah, here is the solid and the dashed. You can see that the this overlapping region here is minimized when we make use of uh, the magnifications and time delays. And this again shows how we can increase the confidence in our lens event pairs if we make use of uh, this mgal like uh, ranking statistics uh, okay so next i wanted to talk about microlensing uh, so this is a uh, uh, much more uh, co complicated effect in the uh, gravitational wave domain compared to what we again must have you must have heard of in the EM. Uh, in the EM, the microlensing that you may have heard of is either microlensing from stars or within our own galaxy or from stars uh, in extra galactic uh, sources, other galaxies. So, at least in the context of strong lensing, what happens is that suppose you have a background quasar which is lensed by a galaxy, then the stars in that galaxy will further uh, cause lensing of those quasar images, and that is called microlensing. Uh, and those kind of effects have been seen. Uh, so similar phenomena is expected here. We can expect microlensing by isolated point sources anywhere in the line of sight, or these strong lensing plus microlensing effect. Uh, but what is uh, much more complicated here uh, is that it, it, the, uh, the microlensing effects are not uh, something very simple. So let me just quick, uh, say that. Um, so 
So going from the EM lensing to the GW lensing, when we are talking about lensing by galaxies, then uh, we are working in the what is called the geometrical optics limit. So that, that's where the wavelength of the gravitational waves is much smaller than the lens mass or the Schwarzschild radius of the, the galaxy scale lenses. Uh, and so in those cases, the magnification factor is just one single factor between multiple images. And so the, uh, if we think of it in terms of the gravitation wave signals, then one event will be one event will have a magnification factor of mu one, the other will have mu two. So these can be basically like scaled versions of each other. But when we now talk about the microlensing um, sort of phenomena uh, coming from these stars, like isolated stars or stars within galaxy or stellar remnants like black holes and maybe dark matter, very uh, compact uh, objects or dark matter and so on, then we could be in the regime where the wavelength uh, of gravitational waves is either comparable or uh, much greater than the lenses. And here the diffraction effects uh, become very uh, important. So in this case, what happens is that uh, the, the blue signal uh, is not simply a scaled version of the uh, the this orange one. So in the orange one, now you start to see frequency dependent magnification. So the, the shape of the waveform itself uh, gets modulated as a function of the frequency. And so, um, so computing these um, uh, microlensing effects in, in this particular domain becomes much more challenging. And even more so if you are uh, considering a population of microlenses, uh, which is what you would expect to see in a ga lensing galaxy where there are lots of stars or stellar remnants. So let me skip this. So one of the things that we wanted to understand and uh, analyze is that since, you know, if we see a strongly lensed event based, uh, sorry, uh, if you see a strong lens system in a uh, gravitational wave domain, uh, then it can, it is very probable that uh, these images, these multiple images that we will see, they will be affected by the micro lenses, meaning the stellar population which are which are there in the lensing galaxy. Uh, this is, as I said, like this is already seen in lensed quasars, lensed supernovae. So, what should we expect to see for lensed gravitational wave sources? So, to understand that, we uh, uh, we uh, implemented this framework where we can model the uh, entire stellar population as micro lenses on top of our strong lenses. Uh, and so here we are showing um, how the amplification, these are called the amplification curves as a function of the frequencies, how they look like for the type one images and the type two images. So here we have shown for different macro magnification, meaning the magnifications of the main images. These are called the macro magnifications. Um, and we, are, we also need to specify the local uh, micro lens density. So you can see that uh, if if the image is very close to the the center, or so very close to the uh, yeah the center of the galaxy, then the density uh, of the stars is going to be much higher compared to an image which is in the outskirts. <laughs> the local uh, micro lens density environment of the macro images is going to be different. So that's what we are also um, uh, modeling here. So here we have, so as I said, the first column here shows the, <clears throat> the macro magnification. And then the second column that's shown here is the micro lens density. So what we are, uh, so in the x-axis, we are showing the uh, LIGO frequency range. Uh, the most sensitivity lies between 10 and 1000. So in the mid middle part of this. So what we can see is that for different types of images, type one, type two, we can see strong microlensing effects or distortions or modulations coming from microlensing at higher frequency over here in all of these plots. Uh, and uh, then we also uh, specifically only change the only change the microlens density, or here we only change the macro magnification, and then we again analyzed which of these factors are affecting most. And what we find is that the changing the macro magnification of the images uh, produces much more um, uh, vivid effects or uh, stronger effects of microlensing, uh, meaning whenever an image is already has a high magnification coming from the main strong lens, then the microlensing effects will also be boosted. 
uh, okay i'll skip this and then we uh, we ask the question uh, if you have some n number of strong lenses in your data what is the probability that you will see micro lens uh, micro lensing or micro lensed events in the particular data so here we sampled the uh, strongly lensed population in the micro lens density space and the macro magnification space so here we restricted ourselves to magnification factor of less than 10 so you can say low to moderate macro magnification and when we analyzed uh, so we, we generated these kind of micro lens signals and then uh, we performed a match between the micro lens signal and an unlensed signal to see how strong the micro lensing effects are so um, so we generated uh, hundreds of realizations for those different points in that parameter space and what what we're plotting here is the match on the y axis on the x axis we are plotting the binary parameters uh, so uh, there is no particular dependence so you can ignore the which parameters are shown here. But the, what we are seeing here is basically for almost entire uh, population of our, uh, in, our in the mock uh, analysis, they all have match better than 97%, which means uh, for the cases, uh, for all these cases here, uh, for all these uh, olive green points, which are less than uh, macro magnification of 10, for all these cases, we are basically seeing that there is a very good match between an unlensed event and a micro lensed event, which means that the standard methods of uh, which are based on MAC filtering and so on, they will uh, not detect this micro lensing. They will just see them as just some unlensed event. Uh, so it's a good thing and or a bad thing. Uh, so what we are in this particular study, we said that basically the detection or the even the parameter estimation of these events. Um, well, the detection for sure will not be affected uh, because the the effects are so weak for mu less than 10. 10. Uh, but in the subsequent analysis, we are going to go to the higher magnification regime. And as we showed before, when you go to higher magnification for the macro magnification, then the micro lensing effects also become stronger. And that's when we will start to see uh, many more effects. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of this. And I'm just going to show again this one particular result which is uh, showing uh, for the, again, the posterior overlap sort of analysis where the, the y-axis uh, high values, meaning there is high, high overlap between the parameters. So it means that it's a uh, strongly lensed event. So the, the black points here, uh, they are for strongly lensed event pairs. Uh, and you can see in many of these cases, they are, they are showing high values. Uh, the x-axis is for different image pair combinations with the first and the third image and second and the third image out of the quad. Uh, so what we're showing with the black points is if the events have only strong lensing effect, they have high uh, this uh, base factor value. Now in the same event pair, if we include, include the micro lensing effects and now we do the posterior overlap analysis, then it decreases our confidence in these being strongly lensed events because the micro lensing effects in each of these event pairs are going to be different. Uh, as I showed in that image, right? Based on the location, based on the local micro lens density, the effects are going to be different. So if the event pairs have micro lensing in them, but they are analyzed as though they are only strongly lensed, then it decreases their base factor. So uh, and this this is shown for some two two or three cases. We've consistently found that in all these cases, the uh, once we include the micro lensing, it in, uh, decreases these base factor values. Um, so we need to repeat this for a larger sample uh, to be, you know be more confident about this. But this is basically what we are seeing, and this means that the current strong lensing pipelines, uh, if they are if there is a true micro lens event in there, then it may be affected. Uh, the its detectability will go down uh, if we don't include the micro lensing in the analysis. So let me just summarize here. Um, uh, you know, we are working on this rapid and efficient detection of uh, CBD signals uh, using machine learning algorithms. Strong lensing, even if it is rare, is expected to be seen in future observations and. So we, of course, we need rapid and efficient methods to detect strong lensing as well. 
So there are uh, lots of developments happening on that front as well. Microlensing, uh, when it is severe, uh, oh, I, I didn't get a chance to show this, but it, it can affect your parameter estimation of the binary black holes. Uh, this uh, the one number that I wanted to quote was that in the current observing run, uh, if we detect strong lensing, we don't know whether we'll, but if we detect some n number of strong lens, lens events, then we expect 50% of them to be strongly affected by microlensing. And so it is important that we are aware of this issue and try to do something about this. And um, uh, overall significance of uh, strong lensing detection decreases if microlensing effects are not accounted. That's, that's what I'm seeing here. So uh, yeah, that's all I would like to end with. Thanks. Okay, questions. Although there are a lot of questions during the talk, if there are any residual remaining questions, please go ahead. I need to. Okay, Juni. Yeah, please go ahead. First of all, it was a really fantastic talk. I'm very happy to come. Thank you. Uh, from the uh, distance, uh, can I take on the distance of the lens scale? Uh, how much is the lens scale? Uh, can the gravitational lensing can be detected? Uh, threshold on what? Uh, threshold on uh, the lens scale, like how many redshift, till which the lensing can be affected, or till which the lensing can be detected properly? Uh, uh, you mean the redshift of the background or the foreground? The background. The background. Uh, there is no such limit, I would say, uh, but uh, one can always say which is more likely, thanks, yeah, which is more likely, uh, if you want to see something which is at a very high redshift, you also need a very high magnification factor so that it will become detectable, right? And if you look at the distribution of magnification, then high magnification is rare. You typically have magnification factors of a few two or ten or so. So anything that has very high magnification factor is going to be there. Uh, so, but it's not impossible. So is there any such possible uh, chances that via this gravitational lens, we can detect the primordial, uh, we can detect the, the primordial data from the stochastic background from very high So by primordial data, what do you mean? Like uh, what kind of primordial data? Uh, those gravitational data that was given to us just now. Oh, so you're talking about primordial data. Yeah, yeah. So I think, if I am correct, you are talking about the lensing yeah. of the GW, of the, of the back, yeah, yeah. Yeah. cosmological GW yeah. background. Like you see, the yeah, exactly. it's like so from compared to what? Um, or we can detect that, or we can detect that the gravitational data from the C and the So, the other one. So, that would so be the, the, I think the problem is that in order to be able to see the gravitational signal coming from that epoch, on the, from the primordial or the early images, the frequency range that one barely expect to see sufficient sensitivity is much lower than the LIGO frequencies. Suppose we are observing in that uh, phase, then we will basically see the same kind of thing that you are seeing also in the EM is my line thinking. Yeah, so I think, I think first answer is that first we have to detect the primordial gravitation like that. That's already not, not yet detected. Then comes the re-cleansing of the gravitational uh, background waves to the large scale gravitation. But yes, it's possible far in the future. <laughs> and when the appropriate detectors are there, when the appropriate detectors Because the background, the, the primordial GW has not been detected. One that you are Any other questions? Yes, I already have two questions. No, I answered question and have three questions. So, uh, first one is about bleep detection. So, you are about what? The bleep detection. The bleep detection. Bleep, bleep. Ah, bleep. So, uh, you are doing after applying that uh, sign Gaussian target. But even in the chart signal, I see they are different. So can I apply CNN you, in the no, chart signal? Like, I mean, of course, there will be a handful of cases which will be different 
they're they're not perfectly they're not perfectly identical or similar right but statistically if you are not able to get rid of the blip signals then you need to have a better method so no 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 i'm saying i will apply the cnl okay in the okay. chirp signal uh -huh. itself that in the okay. chirp signal you mean in the time 